Good morning. Well, this one's not necessarily a super popular topic among Americans, but um, in Ezekiel 38, verse 13, in the midst of the discussion about those nations around Israel, her neighbors and such, some many of whom are becoming friends in our day currently, but will soon be um, enemies against her, um, those nations will gather against Israel and they will uh, seek to plunder her. The leader of Russia and her uh, leader at that time, if it's in our day, that would be Putin, uh, but Gog and Magog ultimately coming against Israel, bringing this band of nations locally, her neighbors and that, uh, reaching down into northeastern Africa uh, from the other post, most parts of the north and that, coming against her to plunder her. And uh, in, ch in chapter 38, verse 13, there are a couple of nations mentioned uh, that are sort of on the sidelines, um, chastising or questioning at the very least uh, what those nations are doing. And uh, they're questioning, saying, are you really coming here to plunder and to take spoil and such? Uh, those nations are Sheba and Dedan, which we know today geographically are in the area of Saudi Arabia. Also mentioned Tarshish and her young lions and this uh, this becomes possibly the only place really that if America is mentioned in biblical prophecy uh, this would be the only possible location Tarshish speaking of uh, Britain her young lions would likely therefore then represent those nations that were born of her uh, nations like the United States and, and such. Um, and, uh, and in that battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39, uh, Tarshish and her young lions are not actively engaging in it, but rather they are watching from the side. In other words, they're not coming to Israel's aid, but they're also not necessarily coming against her. Um, now, this, of course, presents a question. You know, how is it that America... Uh, a superpower uh, involved in global affairs in virtually every way, uh, how is it that a nation like ours would seemingly be irrelevant in a battle like Ezekiel 38? Why, why wouldn't we come to her aid? Why wouldn't we play some part in that? Well, there's a number of theories or ideas, I should say, as far as why that might be. One is that we might uh, militarily just not be relevant. Something may have happened to us that we're kept on the sidelines. Uh, that's something that's uncomfortable for us to consider because, again, we are a superpower. We, uh, you know, the military might that America has makes it seem seemingly impossible to imagine that kind of a scenario, but we never know. It could be, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's surprising for all the military might that we have how easy it might actually be to create some issues uh, that could that could stagger us, you know. Uh, Ted Koppel, I think, wrote a book about uh, an EMP going off and, and wiping out our electricity and all of our communications and weapons and things like this. I think it was Ted Koppel, uh, former news anchor. But, um, you know, so things like this could happen. You never know. The landscape can change very quickly. Another reason, and the one I'm pulling for, is that the rapture happens and that an awful lot of uh, believers... Uh, well, all believers at that time will be snatched away. Uh, the bride will be taken by the bridegroom and brought to go be with the Lord forevermore. And so, um, if that's the case, and of course my hope is that there are many, 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 many Americans that are genuine believers in Jesus Christ and put their trust and faith in Him for their salvation and therefore would be snatched away. And that that would have enough of an impact and throw our country into enough chaos uh, where, um, you know, where it would, it, would, it would force us to be on the sidelines. We wouldn't be prepared to take on a battle <coughs> like that under such circumstances. Uh, another possibility, though, and one that I'm kind of, you know, thinking about and considering a little bit more and more, is that maybe the cost of our involvement personally as a nation might be too high for us to want to get involved. Um, you know, we have a president right now who's demonstrated some extremely pro-Israel uh, policies, and, of course, I applaud that tremendously. Um, but that doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. 
And I don't just mean that if, uh, you know, that if another party takes the office, that that's the only way that could happen. You know, traditionally speaking, <clears throat> at least in the modern era, at least we'll even just focus on the, the hyper-modern era, like in the, you know, previously, uh, a Demo our Democratic president, uh, Barack Obama, uh, you could not necessarily say he was pro-Israel for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is you can't give pallets of cash to, to Iran and be considered a friend of Israel. I mean, you know, uh, Iran is actively seeking to destroy Israel in every imaginable way. And so to give them loads and loads of cash uh, is really not a friendly gesture toward Israel. So you, it'd be a hard case to make that, that Obama was pro-Israel. Trump, on the other hand, is very pro-Israel. And so it's hard for us to imagine, you know, kind of turning our backs on her at this time. Uh, and so the natural tendency is to think, well, gosh, if, you know, if Biden gets in, if a Democratic president uh, gets into power, you know, say goodbye to our friendship with Israel. And that would likely be true. But I wouldn't limit our thinking to saying, oh, if, as long as the Republicans in the White House where our relationship with Israel is safe, or as long as a Democrat is in, it's not. Um, you know, things can change, uh, and change rapidly. Uh, you know, Trump could uh, make moves that undermine Israel, maybe not publicly, but privately. Um, you know, it doesn't seem likely, but it could be. Uh, if you remember back in the, uh, uh, I don't remember the first time I read about this, I'm not that old, but uh, Ronald Reagan, for example, was my favorite president in history, uh, incidentally, uh, was a Democrat. He started as a Democrat. And eventually he changed to the Republican Party. And when asked about it, they said, well, why did you become, you know, why did you leave the Democratic Party? And he said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me, which, which speaks of ideologies changing. I'm not entirely sure John F. Kennedy would be a Democrat today, to be honest with you, but that's another thing. Anyway, so... But, but ideolo ideologies change, people's views on things change. It's, a, uh, you know, in, during the Holocaust, you know, the Republican Party did not come to the rescue of Israel, uh, you know, necessarily, and so, nor did the church for that matter. And so, uh, you know, when we talk about being friendly with Israel, that's, it, it may lean Republican as far as, you know, those that favor Israel and are pro-Israel, but, those things can change. And in the time of Ezekiel 38 and 39, it could very well be that the cost of coming to the aid of Israel would be too great for us. And so we stand on the sidelines politically just gesturing and talking, but not necessarily actively helping Israel. Um, it's understandable why Saudi Arabia might be on the sidelines, even though they, um, you know, they're allowing air flights over their airspace now. And there's relationships being built and this kind of thing and, and certainly we have friendly relationships with Saudi Arabia by and large um, you know it's they're also Muslim they're an Arab country and so it's one thing to not go to war against Israel it's another thing to, or it's, another, it's one thing to uh, you know to, to be friendly with Israel but it's another thing to, to side with Israel against your Muslim brothers and so uh, it's understandable why Saudi Arabia would be on the sidelines. And, and I just offer the other thing as sort of a suggestion as to why we might be on the sidelines. Uh, it might be that we militarily are just somehow subdued. It may very well be that the rapture happens and, and many believers are gone. And so just the, uh, the pro-Israel sentiment could be taken away during that time. And, uh, but at the very least, the chaos that would ensue might make it difficult for us to participate. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing, again, as I just mentioned, is that it might very well be that it just becomes too costly for us as a nation, uh, whether it's financially or public support-wise or whatever the reason might be, where we just don't come to her aid. Now, that's a localized conflict there in Ezekiel 38 and 39, where we're not actively taking sides in that one, apparently. But uh, in Zechariah 14, verse, uh, really all of Zechariah 14, uh, in Joel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 in particular, we find out that all the nations are ultimately going to come against Israel finally in the last days in, when, when, when God is ready to bring judgment and uh, leading up to the return of Christ as is spoken of in uh, Zechariah 14 when, he's, when Jesus literally steps down uh, on, on, uh, 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 on the mountain, splits the mountain and everything. Um, Sometimes I'm driving, my brain gets a little bit off gear. But anyway, so, um, but, but Jesus literally returns uh, to the Mount of Olives there. And, and, and uh, we see the mountain split. And, and he 
comes to the rescue of Israel, his heritage. Um, and so the point I want to make with that is that as we look forward to Ezekiel 38 and 39 coming, I tend to think the rapture will come before that takes place. Uh, I kind of believe that kind of firmly, actually. But um, however that pans out, you want to remember that Israel is God's heritage. They're his chosen people. And the place that we as believers take in, re in relation to Israel should be one of being pro-Israel. Not meaning we're, we're for everything they do. Not everything Israel does is something we would approve of. But we should be of the mindset that if they are God's people, we should also love them too. And we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem as the scriptures teach us. Um, you know... We should not be anti-Semitic. We should not be against Israel. Again, we don't agree with everything they necessarily might do, but for a Christian to have vitriol toward Israel or to be anti-Semitic uh, is, is to set yourself up against God's chosen ones. And that is an awful place to be. And sadly, it's becoming an extremely popular position. I mean extremely popular position. Uh, in, within the church itself, partly because I think the, the church, the American church in particular, has a wildly off-base eschatology, uh, where we think that somehow, you know, America is going to be this place that not only is God blessing now, but, but you know, we're going to be great forever and all this kind of thing. Or we believe that the church is going to uh, somehow usher in the coming uh, kingdom of God, or that, it, or that the church, frankly, at the heart of this, uh, some of these theologies, is the idea that the church has replaced Israel, replacement theology. That's horrifying. That's a terrible idea. That's that's a completely unbiblically off base uh, idea, and it's costly. Um, and so we should never adopt that kind of a mindset as believers. But rather, we should be among those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We should stand on the side of those with whom God stands on the side of. Uh, again, that doesn't condone everything they do, but Israel is not God's chosen people because they deserve to be <clears throat> any more than you and I are saved because we deserve to be. And so we need to understand the theology behind that and not just put our personal feelings and sentiments in the mix and then decide how things ought to be because that's just how we think they ought to be. And so be mindful of these things as we move into the days ahead. And, and as a last thought, something I've often said, <clears throat> you and I as believers, ultimately at the end of the day, patriotic though we might be, I'm an extremely thankful American. I'm somebody who's extremely thankful that, uh, uh, that, that I'm an American and that truly I believe God has shed his grace on us. All of this. Uh, but at the end of the day, you and I as believers are first and foremost monarchists. We are not Democrats or Republicans. We are monarchists, which means we are waiting for the kingdom of God. We are waiting for Jesus, the king, to come back and set up his kingdom. While we're here, we occupy ourselves with his business. We are actively uh, seeking that which uh, he would seek to be done, bringing righteousness, exposing unfruitful works of darkness, and all these kinds of things. That's part of our that's our marching orders while we're here. But at the end of the day, we're not just trying to restore America. We're ultimately working toward bringing people into the kingdom of God so that when Jesus does come, uh, there are many, many of the, the growing number of the 10,000s of his saints that come with him will just be an ever-increasing number. And so we celebrate that. We look forward to that. We are um, excited about what God is doing. But we want to remember that what God is doing is something that is fundamentally its own thing. And where America fits into it is important uh, to us personally right now. But in the overall scheme of things, it's not about America per se. It's about heaven. It's about the Lord. I'm a citizen of the United States and thankful for it, eternally grateful for it. But at the end of the day, I'm first and foremost a citizen of heaven. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, you know, when asked, do you think God is on our side? And he very, very wisely said, the real question is whether or not we're on his side. At the end of the day, we might sing glory, glory, hallelujah. But what's the next line? His truth is marching on. So God help us to be on the side of him uh, with whom we have to do ultimately. And not just be so short-sighted as to think that it's just simply about um, uh, so much of the things that we get so wrapped up in. 
um, have a right view of theology and eschatology. Spend time in the scripture and understand that God means what he says and, and, and build your understanding of his truth accordingly. So that said, uh, just a quick prophecy brief, sort of, not really talking so much about a lot of specifics of what's going on. We'll talk about those things, obviously, in continuing podcasts. But, um, but this was really on my heart this morning as I was just kind of praying and meditating over some of these things. And so I thought I would share them. And hopefully, as always, I just hope there was some value. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for giving us an opportunity to consider the things of God, to think about your people and where they fit ultimately in your purposes right at the very heart of it and where we might fit in regard to uh, your purposes in our lives as we move closer and closer to the unfolding of so many of the events that you've spoken about in the last days. So help us to be girded up, ready to go out into the world, doing uh, those things that are your business, occupying ourselves with your purposes, leading people into a relationship with Christ, helping us to <clears throat> be strong as believers, understanding what your word has to say, and walking in these things. And Father, in that sense, in that in same sentiment, Lord, Help us not to define theology by our own preconceived ideas, but let your word be the guide that helps us to understand your ways, your purposes, and ultimately how you'll bring all things about. Father, we thank you and praise you and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as always, if you want to comment below in the, on our YouTube channel or on my uh, website at parsonspad.com, you can do that. You can email me at parsonspad.com, on that website, there's a link, or you can also uh, go to our church's website at calvarychapelfranklin.com, and you can email me there as well. I definitely love hearing your thoughts and ideas. I uh, love interacting with you on it. Certainly love the encouragement. That's always wonderful too. But but I really love interacting with people that maybe even don't agree with these perspectives. And so uh, some of these discussions and ideas that are raised make it into a podcast where we discuss them a little further. So feel free to let me know and uh, uh, what you think. And, uh, and we'll look forward to catching up with you next time. And until then, God bless you.